I woke up in the middle of the night with um, chills and vomiting and what I now recognize was shortness of breath. I couldn't walk and I couldn't speak more than maybe you know, two to three words. And eventually I couldn't eat either. Eating just made me feel like I couldn't get enough air. My name is Fiona Lowenstein. Um, I'm based in New York City and I'm a writer, producer, yoga teacher, and I run Body Politic, which is a queer feminist wellness collective. And I'm 26. I have no pre-existing conditions, no autoimmune disorders, no respiratory issues. I work out six times a week. I'm a yoga teacher. Again, I work in wellness. So in many ways, I kind of think of myself as, you know, the picture of health. So I definitely didn't think of myself as a part of one of these, you know, vulnerable populations. I first became sick on Friday, March 13th. Um, I felt fine all day and then around 8 or 9 p.m. started getting a headache and just feeling feverish. The next morning, Saturday, I had a cough. And then Sunday, actually, the fever went away and I seemed to be doing a lot better. Um, I thought that that was kind of it and I would just, you know, be maybe recovering a little bit on Monday, but started making plans to like shower and just get back to some of the household things that I had neglected. Um, and then Sunday night into Monday morning, I woke up in the middle of the night with um, chills and vomiting and what I now recognize was shortness of breath. Even though, again, I was isolating from the moment I got sick and thinking this could be coronavirus, I really just didn't believe that it could get that serious. I just didn't want to, first of all, take away resources from other people that might need them more. Um, I didn't want to leave my house if I had coronavirus because I didn't want to risk infecting others and I didn't live within walking distance of the hospital, so I was going to have to take a car service there like Uber or Lyft. And then also there was a part of me that was like, what if I don't have the virus and then I go to the hospital and I get put in a coronavirus ward and I catch the virus. So, um, I mean, I'm very, very grateful to my partner and my doctor for essentially just forcing me to go um, because I do think that I went at the last possible moment. The walk from the lift door to the emergency room, like front desk, was I couldn't even do it in one shot. I had to sit down halfway through in the middle of the street and catch my breath. We called ahead of going to the hospital, which as I understand is what anyone should do. We went through security and then we went to the front desk and I immediately had to sit down and they just told me to go sit in the regular waiting room. Then suddenly I hear the receptionist like screaming at security because apparently they were supposed to have given us medical masks um, when they found out that we were there for coronavirus and they didn't. So we were given masks and then we were ushered into a separate waiting room that was much smaller, much more crowded. Um, the original waiting room we were in, which was almost empty, I think that was just kind of the general admission room, and then we were put in the coronavirus room, and there was only one seat left in there. We were only there for a couple minutes though before they put us in our own, uh, in our own room, and this was me and my partner who had been taking care of me but trying to isolate from me as much as possible. We waited, I would say, about four hours before we saw a doctor, um, which, you know, the ER can be like that. In the, at this point, it was like 11 p.m. at night. Sometimes that can happen. Um, but I think also they were a bit overwhelmed. No one there was at all surprised to see me. Like they were constantly telling me that there were lots of other young people who were being admitted and they were increasingly seeing more and more people in their 20s and 30s. The main thing they gave me was oxygen. Um, but even that, it took I would say six hours from us first getting there for me to get the oxygen mask. The doctors and the nurses were incredibly frustrated. I mean, they told me that the protocols were constantly changing for them. Um, they told me when I got there that this hospital didn't provide tests. Then they told me that it did, but the test results wouldn't be back for 10 days. Then they told me that it had changed and I could get my test results in a few hours. Then they told me that I wouldn't be able to get them for 24 hours. I mean, they were, they were very confused and they were very open about the fact that they were not getting clear instructions. I was also told by the person who did my EKG said, you know, we're not getting tested either. And I know I've been exposed at least three times and we don't have the protective gear that we need. 
And then another nurse said to me, I'm really worried that, you know, in a couple weeks time, we could be having to make decisions about who lives and who dies. It's just a really weird experience to go to the hospital and be a patient. And, you know, you're used to kind of the doctors and the nurses knowing what's going on and taking care of you. And I almost felt like we were taking care of each other. Like they were also in, you know, a state of distress and dealing with arguably more than I was. And it was, it was a very hectic situation. And I'm very grateful to them all because they were usually emotionally supportive at points when I was you know breaking down just from being alone and being scared um, and they were working constantly both of us were told in the ER that we were not eligible for testing we were told that we had to have had contact with someone who uh, knew they were COVID positive um, had tested positive or we had to have traveled <clears throat> to Japan, Italy, China, or Korea. I'm sure these rules have changed slightly since then. That was very difficult because like I had had contact with someone who was having all the same symptoms as me and had started those symptoms a few days prior to mine and I'm pretty sure that's where I got it from, but she couldn't get tested either for the same reasons. So I have no idea why I eventually got tested. It was the whole experience of being tested was very odd. They came in they swabbed my nose in the morning without saying anything to me. They didn't tell me I was getting a coronavirus test. And it was almost, there was like a secret, some sort of secrecy around it. And then I got admitted and they told me that um, the ER had actually lost all the tests that they had done that night. So they had to re-swab me. And the test is not, it's not pleasant. It's like a Q-tip very far up your nose, basically type of sensation. Um, so then I got tested again. When I got to the hospital, um, I asked if I should notify all of the students that were in my yoga classes for the past two weeks. Um, and honestly, the response I got was very disheartening. Everyone kind of said, honestly, it doesn't really matter because at this point, people could have been exposed through so many different sources. The level of you know community contagion is so high that they could get it just from riding the subway or just from walking down the street and bumping into someone or going to the grocery store and touching something some someone else has touched. But they felt by that point, they were like, sure, it doesn't hurt to tell them, but it's really impossible at this stage to trace back points of contagion. The studio did contact all the students that I was in class with um, in the past two weeks, but that was not something that the doctors seemed to think was necessarily going to save a lot of people. I got discharge instructions from the hospital that said that the Department of Health would call me in three to five days about being retested um, to see if I test negative. I never received a call from the Department of Health. The instructions also said to wait seven days from the positive COVID test. And if those last three of the seven days are fever free without Tylenol, that then I am eligible to go to a testing center and get tested. This all seemed just very unlikely to me because it was so hard to get a test in the first place. So it said if I didn't hear from the DOH, I should call them myself. The number they gave me at the hospital was an incorrect number to someone's personal voicemail. So yeah, I, I mean. The myth of invulnerability is just that. It, it is a myth. We absolutely can contract this virus and we absolutely can become symptomatic and we can become hospitalized. We're a generation that tends to live with roommates. We're a generation that sometimes lives with our parents, right? Um, we, uh, a lot of us don't have health insurance, a lot of us don't have job security. So there's a lot of ways in which we're vulnerable to this um, kind of in specific ways and also ways in which we can easily pass it to each other to, you know, more vulnerable family members so it's especially important we're also uh, you know a very a large portion of the population Millennials and Gen Z so we can have a pretty big impact with the decisions that we make here all of us have made poor decisions during this crisis at some point right the government certainly made poor decisions which is why we're in this situ this unfair and extreme situation where the burden of uh, social responsibility is being placed on individuals to the extent that it is but also each one of us had a point in the past you know two to three months where we didn't take this as seriously as we should have maybe it was before the information got to our country or you know before before I tested positive for coronavirus right I don't want people to feel you know so embarrassed are so ashamed of those past decisions that they ultimately double down on them and don't course correct. I think I've gotten a lot of messages from people since I started sharing my story. People our age who are saying like, 
I want to be brutally honest, I really was not taking this as seriously as I needed to. I was still visiting friends at their apartments, I was sharing food, um, and I now understand the seriousness of it and I'm going to change what I'm doing. So I think that's the most important thing is like, you know, don't let the shame at what you might have done in the past few weeks or the actions you might have failed to take, don't let that stop you from kind of disrupting whatever social dynamic you're in if those people aren't doing what they need to be doing. We actually have the opportunity here to sincerely impact the course of this public health crisis. So in that sense, it can feel empowering, actually, I think. Um, and I'm going to try and continue to do work in the coming weeks, especially to provide, you know, emotional support and resources for people who are dealing with these symptoms, because I know how scary it can be to be alone and, you know, maybe far from family um, and, and be exhibiting these symptoms that you've been seeing on the news for so long. We all have to change as a result of this. Like there is no going back to the way that the world was before, but as many people have pointed out, we shouldn't want to go back, right? Because that's the broken healthcare structure and, you know, the the government that got us into this situation to begin with. So my hope is that, you know, the world will change permanently after this, but that it will be for the better.